Let's see here. So in terms of uh, ongoing stuff, uh, your, let's see, homework two was due, homework one was due last Friday. Did I get it right this time? Finally, now that it matters. Uh, so that means homework two is due a week from tomorrow, yeah? Hopefully I did that right. Cool. Uh, as a warning, I'm traveling from Friday night through Wednesday. Um, I'll try, I'll, maybe I can hold extra office hours on Friday or something. I'll try to organize something. Um, it means I will not have office hours on Wednesday. If you're super nice to your TAs, maybe we can arrange a trade, but that's on them. We gotta, they, they're not obligated to. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, cookies and things are encouraged for, to, to get their attention. Um, but in any event, um, I will be, although I'll be in the south of France, I'll be reading my email and very sad not to be in Chile, Boston, uh, be teaching undergrads. Uh, but I digress. Uh, so anyway, your homework is, uh, is due next week. Uh, and then uh, the next homework, you'll have everything you need to get started on it after today's lecture. So we're actually ahead of the game a little bit, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and that'll be on implementing skinning stuff. If you haven't looked at the project instructions, you might do that just to, to remember that there exists a project. There's nothing urgent, but you know, don't let that sneak up on you. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Are there any other any, any questions about procedural stuff? Cool. Oh, one other thing is a week from today, I guess, because I will not be at MIT, we'll have a guest lecturer. Uh, he's, uh, his name is Ed. He's a postdoc in my research group. Um, there's also videos of exactly that lecture in previous versions of this course in case you'd like to hear my usual discombobulated speaking, although of course our postdocs and, and, and students are much more incentivized to spend time preparing than your overworked professor. Um, that said, uh, we will not film that lecture, so if you don't make it, it's gone. Um, so consider yourselves warned. Uh, but that's a nice guy, uh, and that'll give you everything you need for the simulation assignment. So we're, 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 we're doing, we're, we're ahead of the game a little. Okay, so let's talk about computer animation. So that's our, our topic today, and this is sort of our continuation of our discussion of transformations from last time. Um, and this really gets into the, finally sort of the core of, of maybe what we think about as computer graphics. Whoa! Instead of, uh, you know, kind of it's just the basic machinery that we've been establishing the last couple weeks. So something that's probably not terribly surprising is that the techniques that we're going to learn uh, in the animation world, and we'll cover quite a bit, this will be several lectures worth of material, many of them are really just an analogy to what people used to do with pen and paper before all this computer technology was available. Um, that really the, the computer animation techniques are, in some sense are just digital translations of uh, uh, <laughs> what might be uh, considered analog uh, animation techniques that have been around for a long time. Right, so of course uh, we're going to see lots of, uh, of images of, of Mickey Mouse. There's probably questionable uh, issues with posting these lectures on YouTube that we're not going to address in this course. Uh, but that aside, uh, the basic uh, approach in, in computer animation, um, or at least what we would call cell animation, um, was a pretty straightforward one, right? So, so typically, uh, and this dates back, what, to the early 20th century, right? There's this funny cartoons with like Mickey Mouse and company. For some reason, their knees are always going like that. Uh, on a, what is it, Steamboat Willie or something? But uh, in, in any event, the way that these animations were made, they're composed of a bunch of pieces, right? There's a background scene, and then maybe a piece of celluloid on top uh, where all the interesting animation was going on. Uh, and there were kind of two types of animators, right? There were the people that drew the keyframes. These are like the expressive poses of the animated characters. Um, but then, of course, you know, there's a lot that happens in between the keyframes. And so then there's some other people whose job it was, which as you can imagine, I mean, I'm not an artist, I'm a terrible, as you've seen on the blackboard, like I can't draw a damn thing. But you can imagine how frustrating these jobs are called in-betweening, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? Where the keyframe artists would draw the, the kind of interesting parts of the animation, then you'd have this big studio full of artists whose job was like to draw a Mickey Mouse, like little perturbations of each other to interpolate between the different frames. Oh my God. That was a good save. Um, right, and so that was the, uh, the traditional animation pipeline as long as things were hand drawn. And then literally, you have a ton of these frames, you stack them underneath a camera, and you just take a photo one after the next, and that was your animated film. Uh, and for the early Disney cartoons and a lot of these other things, that really what was what's going on. Kind of the funny thing is that the innovations that ended up affecting the computer graphics world and how we think of digital animation today actually came some of them from the technology that people were using to make this 
painstaking process, less terrible. Right? So for instance, one of the really clever uh, tricks uh, that they did is, of course, in, in the early Disney films, one thing you'll notice is the camera scrolls, which is like not terribly remarkable, right? I mean, you, you know, it makes some sense, and certainly the background is not just stable. But if you think about it, I mean, as you scroll the camera or you zoom in or whatever, perspective changes, right? Like the, thing, the, the, the point of, of focus and so on is different in every frame as you move your camera around. And somehow these old uh, techniques were able to capture that even though they didn't have rendering technology, right? They weren't just like drawing every, every frame independently. And so there are all kinds of cool ideas involving, you know, in-betweening, multi-perspective panorama. So we talked about a camera projection already. This is a crazy camera projection where what they do is you kind of like scroll your camera like that, and then you take every column of every different frame's camera projection and kind of unroll them this way. So that way, if you have your background of your animated scene is kind of zoomed in close enough, it looks like it's not warped. And then as you scroll your camera across this way, it kind of simulates a camera motion in this 3D world. It's a really clever technique. Uh, and then another thing that people did, which makes a lot of sense, is of course, what I've described for you so far, there's basically two objects. There's a fore foreground and a background. Right? And, and in Steamboat Willie, that's more or less the case, right? There's just one character doing one thing. Um, but in more complex scenes, you know, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast and what have you, um, there's all kinds of interesting effects going on, right? There are multiple characters that are passing by each other. There are things that sort of close, far, and very far camera depths that have to move at different rates as the camera moves around. And simulating and capturing that was, was really the topic of a lot of early development. So for instance, here's this funny old uh, video. I believe this is actually Walt Disney narrating, if I recall, um, which worked in my office this morning, so hopefully it'll work. Aha. Where he introduces one really clever technique uh, for doing this. Which, Let me see if I can turn up the volume. The blueprint of a piece of equipment designed to make cartoons more realistic and enjoyable. This is the plan for a super cartoon camp. We call it the multiplane camp. It was intended for use in our feature length cartoon. You see, we decided for features. The camera needed improvement too. Actually, the free feature cartoon camera fairly simple in construction and operation, and generally very satisfactory. The problem was how to take a painting and make it behave like a real piece of scenery under the camera. The trouble was we were photographing a flat two-dimensional background. <laughs> I love the soundtrack in these clips. So we set about making plans and blueprints for a new cartoon camera that would overcome this. Different elements in the scene were separated according to their varying distances from the viewer. This put the moon on a plane farthest away from the camera. I'm actually curious how they animated the this picture broken down shot. In this manner. Um, it is possible to control the relative speed with which each individual part of it moves to or away from the camera. But the moon remains absolutely still. So it will always remain the same, either growing or shrinking in size. Since this new camera used many planes, we called it the multiplane camera. So I think they show an actual clip of what this looks like. And here now is our same moonlight scene, the way the multiplane camera sees it. As you can see, we finally got the moon to keep its proper distance. Right, so you guys can see that, like, these early ideas were basically just translated directly into the digital systems that people had in early computer graphics. Now my YouTube history is destroyed forever. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, sort of, of course, the first... Yeah, no, I don't want to click. Uh, let me be careful with my mouse here. Some of the early uh, technologies here were basically just computerized translations of this process that they already had developed in the, uh, you know, in the, in the era of celluloid and all this good stuff. Right, so starting in the 1980s, actually, already, a lot of the Disney films were, were already digitized, things like The Little Mermaid, uh, Lion King, and so on. They're made with a piece of software called CAPS, right, for, uh, what, cell animation something system. And uh, uh, interestingly, the people that wrote the software for this actually was sort of the early version of Pixar before it became an animation studio. 
Um, and this is where you can start to see the early computer graphics technology emerge. Whoa. So hopefully you guys can see that like computer animation, it wasn't just like a way to make animation faster, it really changed the art form, right? That, um, in that little, in that one shot that you saw, right? The camera was like scrolling through this 3D scene, it was following the characters around in a way that you just couldn't do with the uh, previous technology, right? Like the multi-plane camera and all that good stuff. In some sense, the technology hasn't advanced that far in a, in a funny way, like this is the basic elements that we still see in, in modern animation now, the, of course the main difference is that your laptop could easily render that thing at like many hundred frames a second. Probably it was quite a tedious process to get the computer animation system in CATS to, uh, you know, reproduce the same frames in the 1980s. Um, but even back then, I mean, these frames were digitally painted and, and really the, the preference was to have the computer be sort of a partner in the artistic process rather than the main tool. And that's the, sort of the bias of the early technology. Of course, yeah, yeah, so th that's absolutely right. You can use a video camera to get similar effects. Um, of course, I would argue that the uh, digital world that you see in this, this video clip is far from anything you'd be able to film. Uh, and, and moreover, I don't think it would actually be so easy to have the camera like swing on the other side of the banister and the stairway and so on. Um, so really, the, uh, the flexibility here is much larger. In fact, actually, I remember an old project that I don't think went very far. We were working with the uh, Imagineers in the, the, the Disney parks at one point. And uh, it was about when WALL-E came out, you know, with the robot and stuff. You guys, I, I, I never know if I'm dating myself in these things. But in any event, they made a WALL-E. Like, they made, I mean, WALL-E's not all that hard to manufacture. It's like a cardboard box. Um, and they had these interesting experiments where they thought, like, maybe I can take, you know, the, the, the animated motion that we'll talk about how to express in a minute, and just project them onto the actual like mechanical parts of the Wally -E robot, um, so that the animators could control it and have like kind of cool expressive motions for this robot. You know, the target being having it like roll up to, next to the weather guy on TV and kind of promote the film, or what, you, you know, whatever. And um, it was a total failure because uh, essentially, you know, animators have no regard for the physical world. And like one arm motion of Wally -E was enough to like launch him off you know, several miles into the air. And uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I, well, you're absolutely right that cameras can, can help these kinds of things. And in certain scenarios, that's precisely what they do, especially in visual effects where typically, you know, they'll make a miniature version of the same scene and kind of film there. 
Um, there's nothing stopping the artist in this kind of fully digital tool from doing completely non-physical stuff. Uh, and indeed, you see that even in these early uh, uh, clips here. So, kind of the, the really interesting thing, and I think what, what you guys should get out of some of these clips is that the early computer graphics technology sort of co-evolved with animation as an art form. And actually, the algorithms that we talk about for animating characters and expressing motion and so on really are drawn from early hand-drawn principles that really predate the computer technology. In fact, there's a really great kind of research paper, kind of tech report, I don't know what you call this thing. Um, it was published at SIGGRAPH in 1987, a few months before I was born. It was a dark time. Uh, about, uh, you know, sort of how to take the principles of animation and apply it in the 3D setting. And really, it works through some of the basic uh, motions and this basic workflow of in-betweening and so on and translates it into digital terms. Uh, you already heard in some of these video clips some of the terms that we'll talk about, like squash and stretch, um, which have to do with the animated physical world being completely different from the F equals MA physical world that we're all used to. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, by the way, there's this very famous old book. Has anybody ever seen it or paged through it? Yeah, it's written by some old folks at, at Disney. And it's worth a look, where they try to kind of codify this Disney art form and like what is this weird alternative universe of motion and physics that happens in an animated film and how does it contrast with uh, everyday life. Uh, and there, there are many different uh, principles that, that you learn if you take a digital animation course. Um, so for instance, uh, there are these two terms that show up all over the place and indeed, actually they to show up in certain splines, like certain splines we'll talk about having a squash and a stretch parameter. Um, and essentially, uh, this is this basic notion that physics in the digitally animated world is completely different from physics around you uh, in, in, in some particular ways. So when we talk about squash, um, objects in animated world tend to be much more gooey than the ones around us, right? So you can see this, this bouncing ball squashes all the way out of the ground and then comes, you know, it has a, what, a very large coefficient of restitution, right? It pops right back up and comes off of the ground. Um, and moreover, uh, there's something that's maybe, I think our, our brains are so used to looking at, we don't even think about too much. But what else is strange about this motion? Not only is it the ball just like have weird physical parameters, like it's made of a weird material, the ball anticipates that it's gonna touch the ground. Does physics do that? No, right? So like you can see this, this drawn out sort of uh, motion here. Um, there's like some level of intelligence that happens in the animated physical world that simply doesn't happen uh, in, uh, in real life, right? And so when you're designing animation tools, you have to keep things like timing and weight and expressiveness uh, into account. And moreover, all of these like funny spline models that we're talking about for controlling the degrees of freedom in your animation, you have to think about directly in the context of the type of motion that you want to reproduce in this kind of an animation system. And so, uh, really, this, 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 those are the ideas that have developed. And even though computer animation now is much more complex, you know, the process is, is, is very much similar, right? That's still, there's some people that do keyframing. You'll look at blocking, just like you might block a, uh, you know, production that you hold on the stage. And then people will go back and fill in all these minute details of squash and stretch and expressiveness. And the, the motion of your mouth and your eyes is typically one that, that happens at a pretty late stage because you've got to wait for your voice actors. Um, the added complication being that, you know, when you run a render, what is this guy's name? Um, Lightning McQueen. Thank you, guys. You know, these can take up to 100 hours per frame of your film. So like that, that feedback loop is, is quite slow, right? And so often the animation tools happen at a stage before you can get that final readout of what it's going to look like, making this whole cycle quite complicated. Of course, nowadays, uh, the video games, you know, this is done in 11 milliseconds per frame. Um, you can capture almost similar behavior uh, in a much smaller scale. But again, the techniques are quite similar. Okay, so as usual, I've gotten all excited about these things, but I haven't told you what we're actually going to cover on a technical level. Um, so that's our, our job. Now, we're going to have a quick, <coughs> oh boy, a quick overview of uh, different types of animation, and then which roughly follow our next couple lectures in this course, particularly the first and the third. We'll talk a lot about keyframing, um, and then physically based animation, which is a sort of politically correct term for like, we're going to start with physical laws, but if we don't end up satisfying them, we're kind of cool with that. Um, 
We'll talk about typical animation controls, and then we're going to talk about one technique in character animation, which is something called skinning, where maybe I've you know, animated the bones of a moving character, and my task is to have the actual material attached to those bones and move with them. Okay. So uh, let's start with a little bit of an overview of animation. Uh, the one that we've already seen uh, in, the, in the videos today is, is a particular concept called keyframing. Um, which is by far the most typical approach, even by the way, sometimes when you see scenes that look like physics, really what's going on behind the scenes is somebody specifying a keyframe. Um, where you, you specify a scene at different key points in time, and now your computer is going to take the role of this in-betweener and interpolate all of these different uh, frames in between. So typically your keyframes, for example, remember in our last lecture we talked about like all the different bone positions that you might you know, specify to, to keyframe an animated character. What tool do you think we're going to use to do in-betweening? I've already covered it. Splines, right? But now the splines, instead of being in space, are going to be in time, right? They're going to interpolate these different parameters of our joints. Um, and now that velocity that we were saying doesn't matter for drawing on a curve is going to matter for animation. Incidentally, in-betweening is, is, is a quite a complicated process, and people still study these problems now. I mean, even in this goofy example where I'm, I don't know, tossing the Stanford bunny for some reason, in-betweening a rotation of the Stanford bunny is not so easy. Um, like, how do you interpolate rotation matrices is a, a problem that, that already computer graphics people argue about all the time. It's like kind of a topic we like to get in fights about over beer. But there are other types of animations too. So another one is a procedural animation where maybe you write a piece of code whose job in life is to generate the animation. Um, so a typical procedural animation might be, you know, I look at the wall, I look at the, my CPU clock and I want to generate an actual animating, ticking, whatever you call this thing, pocket watch. And, you know, now I have a piece of code that rotates the different, you know, uh, arms in the clock based on the time on my CPU, right? So this is a little bit different from in betweening because I'm not specifying the keyframe, the computer is doing that for me. Um, procedural animation becomes really, really important when you have things like Lord of the Rings or whatever, and you've got like a million orcs that are coming to attack Harry Potter, and like there's a lot going on, and they're all flying all over the place and not particularly intelligent, and they're all rolling around. Like asking an animator to do that by hand is just a no go, right? And moreover, using like motion capture is not really possible. Like I, 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 I challenge you guys to do mocap on like two people wrestling. And uh, so in that case, maybe what you do is you write a piece of code that simulates a really unintelligent set of human beings, you know, charging at the enemy, uh, and then you just set them loose, and, and, and that would be sort of a very typical example of procedural animation, right? So in that case, you're like encoding the interactions between the characters and then letting it play out as like differential equation or something. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, places where that occurs, right? The classic examples are in cloud, sorry, cloud maybe, crowd simulation. Um, you know, crowds are really fascinating phenomena where individually people act like humans, but then if you zoom out far enough, they act like a fluid. I don't know if you've, you've ever seen this before. Where like, this happens often in emergencies where like you're in a stadium and then like there's a fire and everybody needs to leave and suddenly humans turn into like particle physics and they like are getting stuck and there's like, you know, div and grad and curl, and that's really what's determining their motion. You laugh, but that really is true, and there are many actually psychological studies that try to figure out, like, what is that transition point where humans stop acting like humans? It's just purely, like, Navier-Stokes equation. Um, and they're really fascinating phenomena that can be captured that way. Procedural animation also happens a lot in, like, kind of natural scenes, or there's also a related area of procedural modeling where maybe I generate a whole city block by coming up with different rules for generating, you know, buildings out of, you know, basic building blocks and so on. And then finally, uh, in this class, we will talk quite a bit about physically based animation where, like, I specify some physical laws, F equals MA, you know, whatever things go into in my piece of cloth that's flying around, and now I run a uh, physical simulation tool uh, to capture the motion. I think we're all quite familiar with this. Anybody that's seen any of the modern action films has seen a ton of physical animation, everything from, you know, water simulation. So here's some, here's a kind of a fun clip. I don't think we need the audio for this one. Right, so these are all digitally produced uh, uh, fluid simulations. If you look really closely, sometimes you can kind of guess the algorithm that goes on behind these things. This is, you know, a fun thing to do for me. Um, but it's really amazing that, that these are essentially 
tools that are doing nothing more than simulating physics. If you like, go over to uh, the Center for, for what is it, CCE, the Center for Computational Engineering, and listen to like their aero astro people talk about how they simulate airplanes and airfoils and so on. Exactly the same set of tools, right? Um, but really, the level of, of, of realism has, has reached just uh, an incredible level here. So we'll talk about a few basic models for fluid simulation in this course, and then your next assignment, well, two assignments from now, you'll implement a cloth simulator, uh, which is just basically a network of springs. So you can totally see what fluid simulation tool they're using here, right? There's some particles that are getting lost. Um, yeah, by the way, every year students always want to do fluids for their course project. That's fine, but be creative. I'm tired of grading those. Okay. Um, and they, they never get it right. It's, it's, it's very hard to get right. Um, and these days, uh, we can couple uh, physically based animation with machine learning and other tools uh, to even create some intelligent characters that are interacting with the physical world. So there's this whole area where there's some amount of physics, some amount of intelligence uh, that are all interacting to do some neat stuff. Let's see if we can fast forward to the fun part. Maybe. Come on, YouTube. So here, uh, so there's a very uh, uh, typical technique called space-time optimization, where you're trying to trade off. Like on the one hand, you have f equals ma, and on the other hand, you'd like your jumping character to land on a particular spot, right? And so, what you'll do is maybe minimize deviation from the physical law to sneak things past people's eyes. But at the same time, the artist wants to control what happens in the scene, so it's not purely physics, right? So a very typical thing, you know, like. Maybe you know they, they, they you drop a big pile of cards and then they spell out your name on the ground, but the motion between those frames looks like physics. Obviously, it's not because the probability of that happening is basically zero, right? Um, but there's so much chaos in the world, you can kind of leverage that to have artist directable, nearly physical motion. Um, and the really beautiful and amazing thing is that a lot of the motions you're seeing in clips like this are not generated by hand or by like doing machine learning on like filming a bunch of people in front of a mocap. System. They're just byproducts of the fact that I've given this guy an objective function to stand up and physics works the way that it does. Um, in fact, there, there are a lot of people in the intersection of computer graphics and biomechanics. Uh, it's actually a pretty common combination of, of research disciplines. Okay, so there's our, our basic sort of set of vocabulary words in the animation world. Um, now let's talk about how you might go about controlling animation. And I think this doesn't really come as a big surprise, right? Uh, a very typical thing to do because we're lazy is not to you know, specify the pose of every single piece in every single frame, but rather to specify keyframes of an animated sequence uh, and, and, and then have the computer fill in uh, what's in between. If you go, one, one thing that I encourage you to do at some point in your life is go sit in on an art class that's using digital animation tools and listen to the way that they talk about this stuff. And you'll see that there's like kind of this interesting back and forth between that world and the way that we develop these, these, these tools. Uh, and, and a lot of it makes a lot of sense. So for instance, we've already talked about you know, inserting knots and keyframes and so on. Um, one of the big no-nos in animated uh, film is to have, you know, you have different splines that are controlling the motion of different pieces of your characters. You never want them to have a knot or a control point in the same frame, right? because then you kind of look like you're you know, animatronic. And so there are all these really beautiful user interfaces where they'll show you the animation on the top, and then on the bottom they'll show you really just the splines where the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is like the angle of your joint. And then people will stare at that display, which is just something you've already done in, in assignment one uh, to, to, to control the animation. It's kind of an interesting analogy between space and time that happens there. Um, of course, not all of these controls are so low level. Um, sometimes people do high-level controls. I've given a link, and I'm already behind in the slides, so maybe we'll skip over. But you should play with uh, Ken Pearl and develop this kind of funny applet where you animate the facial expression of somebody, and it gives you very high-level, you know, like smiling, frowning, and so on. And those are just compositions of uh, basic motions, uh, and cues, and things that they've coupled together in clever ways. Right. So. Um, the animation pipeline, uh, of course, every, every movie studio and every video game studio is, is basically different. Um, we're mostly going to be uh, pretty early on, right? That because lighting and, and rendering is so expensive, uh, we sit somewhere in between modeling and rigging, which we've talked a bit about already, and um, the actual 
sort of uh, rendering thing that happens later, right? So the types of ingredients that go into these tools you've already seen, right? Things like articulated characters, right? Now essentially, rather than just modeling static poses, which we did in our last lecture, we're just going to animate them as a function of time. The very typical thing here to do would be to do forward kinematics, right? Because remember that we already talked about inverse kinematics being a little unstable. If you're like taking the boundary condition for inverse kinematic and, and animating it, making that thing be smooth in time is, is quite challenging. Then, of course, our characters don't look like these weird blobby spherical objects. They look uh, more like uh, this, this gentleman here. Uh, and so sort of our, our main uh, focus for the rest of our lecture today will be this idea of skinning, right? That we're going to embed a skeleton in the interior of a triangle mesh. A triangle mesh is just a static pose, right? It's just one pose of a very detailed shape. So now I'm going to embed this really core shape. Obviously, I'm not going to actually render it on my computer. What I'd like to do is kind of repose the detailed guy and just render him. So in order to do that, what do we need? We need an animation of the bones, which is easy to do using a machine we've already developed, right? Just by taking splines in time. And then what we're missing is to bind the skin uh, vertices to, to the bones as they move. This is a very common thing to do. So for instance, uh, motion capture is, is sort of a combination of inverse kinematic and the same procedure, right? So maybe you, you have a... She looks very happy for having all these, these fiducial markers on her face. But in any event, you, uh, you know, mark your character, which are basically, what, the corner points of these bones, and then your actor, uh, who can be far less expensive than if you were actually filming an actor, which is one of the reasons why people like this technology. Uh, you can, it turns out you can afford many computer programmers for an hour of, of Brad Pitt's time. Um, so you can track uh, these different markers as your character moves, solve a computer vision problem to figure out their, their positions in space, or maybe use an expensive marker that just tells you its position in space. Uh, and then you project that onto the bones of your animated character, you still have the same skinning problem uh, to cope with. Uh, and skinning tools, we'll talk about a very simple model called linear blend skinning in class today. That's really the beginning of the story. Um, the actual skinning things that are used in industry involve, you know, elasticity, understanding the physics of your skin, and so on, uh, to get that last little mile out. Um, and in particular, in places where you see very big bends, like right at the joint of your arm is typically where you can see these models go wrong. Uh, right, so these are the, the sort of uh, things that we do. Another term for this, uh, to, uh, when it's uh, coupled with a motion capture tool, is retargeting. Right, retargeting would be like, you know, Darius and I hold hands and we walk together, and then like, as, as we do on our way out of class most days, uh, and then like we take my front legs and project them onto the front legs of a horse and his legs and maybe the back legs of a horse and now we're animating a character. Obviously there's quite a bit of retargeting that has to happen to translate our motion into the motion of a beast with a very different set of, of, of constraints. Yep. Um, of course, this is the beginning of a big iceberg and there's all kinds of cool tools here, especially now that computer vision and machine learning have been uh, advancing at such a rapid pace, right? One of the big questions is, you know, my, my actors tend to be quite expensive, um, but it's not so expensive to have my iPhone have, what, nowadays three cameras on the back? And so when I do that, uh, I can capture depth and retarget, but I don't have the opportunity to track individual key points, right? And so I need some amount of learning or computer vision to cope with a much higher degree of noise. Incidentally, the technology in this was more or less directly translated into uh, a technology in the iPhone for that goofy animated emoji thing. So if you didn't think this class was practical, now you know better. Um, or similarly, uh, let's see if this video clip will load. In fact, there it is. Um, so what does this technology allow you to do? Well, this is really an advanced application of computer vision, even though you might not be appreciating it, uh, right? That essentially you are taking extremely noisy 3D input finding interesting feature points, projecting those onto the feature points of a turd and animating it in real time on your phone is just incredible. And it's really a triumph of sort of the intersection between computer graphics and computer vision. Okay, you know, this shows up not just on your phone, but of course in industry as well. Okay, so let's dig into the details of uh, uh, skinning a little bit. Um, we're not going to quite get to the stage where you can animate scenes that look like this, but we'll actually get close. It turns out that the linear, linear, blending, linear blend skinning is not all that far off from what goes on in video game style skinning 
Um, in movie studio scanning, where you can afford to take as much computation time as you want, you may actually want to do the physical simulation of skin rather than the hacks that we'll talk about today. Right? Because you really care about the fact that like, when you put your arm at your side, your arm doesn't like, penetrate part of your body, which is, uh, your lies is extremely difficult to, to get right. Okay, so we already know how to animate bones. Our task is to animate the skin. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we're going to use a, a particular technique called uh, skeletal subspace deformation, SSD, or skinning. Um, these have a lot of different names. Vertex blending, matrix palette skinning, linear blend skinning. I think linear blend skinning is actually probably the more typical term these days. But these are all the basically different names for the same thing, which is how to go from the motion of some boring thing composed of a bunch of rigidly moving parts to a kind of glorpy piece of skin in a very simple fashion that basically is a nice application of the machinery we've already uh, developed in this class. Okay, so let's, let's do some details here. So what do we get as input? Well, if you think about it, remember we talked about coordinate systems. We're going to keep building on a shaky house of cards here, right? So two lectures ago, we had one coordinate system. Last lecture, we stacked them all together, right? We had this hierarchy from like hand to arm to upper arm to body to scene. And we compose them all together to get a matrix that goes directly from hand coordinates to scene coordinates and back if you invert. Um, now, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to attach vertices of some triangle mesh to the motion of these rigid bones. And we're going to use the motion of the bones, right, which is just some deformation of the space around the bone. Not even a deformation, just a trans transformation to induce a motion for the, the skin character. Now the question is, well, what do we do? Let's say that we did this in a naive way. Like every, every bone just drags along with a, the, you know, the closest points that it has on the, the skin triangle mesh. Will my animation look particularly good? Think about your elbow, right? So let's say I, my, my bind pose, like my, my triangle mesh is modeled with my arms straight out. I have two bones, one here and one here. I think that's roughly true. I'm not 100% clear on what goes on in there. Um, and now I bend my arm, right? So this stuff moves more or less rigidly, isometrically, if you want to sound fancy and use a geometry term. Similarly here, because there's no, there's no bicep to be had there. What happens in my elbow if, if everything is attached to exactly one bone? Yeah. Yeah, it tears in half, right? So that's not such a good model, <laughs> right? So your skin is going to be rigid, except at the joints where you know, depending on how you render it, it'll either cut or uh, you'll just have one giant triangle that's like yanking from one side of the bone to the other, um, which you probably have actually seen in some, some amateur animation. But instead of that, the basic trick in SSD is to attach a vertex to more than one bone at a time. Okay? And so in particular, every vertex is going to come with a list of numbers that's positive and some somewhat, these are called skinning weights which is telling me basically the influence of every bone on the motion of that vertex on my triangle mesh. Does that make sense? So these, uh, these weights are called skinning weights. Um, and essentially, they, they, they tend to kind of follow this pattern where actually many things do move rigidly, right? Like these colored regions. Now these transitional regions where two or maybe three different bones interact to get the motion of the vertices in between. So there's like some weighted average that happens here and then rigid motion that happens at the other places. Notice, by the way, after I animate this basic skin character, like the fact that like your skin is moving rigidly in between your joints is still not that great. So a, a typical thing to happen is that then you make a second pass over the mesh, and, like smooth it out or get some of that secondary motion or something. Okay. So uh, right. So that's going to be our basic trick. So the the, the color uh, like all the color triangles here are attached to one object, but then we're going to have these transitional areas um, that are attached to more than one. These things are called skinning weights. And in 6837, our skinning weights are going to be given to us. And that's actually typical. This isn't somehow an unrealistic assumption. If you download tools like Maya, um, what you'll see is that there's all kinds of machinery in there for exactly that, where they'll, they'll, the artist will first design a 3D pose of a character. It's typically just one pose. By the way, like at, at lots of animation studios, they'll have a physical like clay studio where somebody will model a character, and then they'll put it in front of the computer, and then they'll just sit there and try to reproduce it digitally, either by scanning or just by using something like ZBrush. But that's just a static object, right? So then the next thing you have to do is skin it, 
which means that you embed your skeleton inside of this object, and then you paint on this thing like, okay, well this bone is going to have this effect, where it's like a bunch of ones and then numbers that decay as you get closer to the joint. Right. Um, automatic skinning is a cool topic in geometry. Um, there are tools for that, and some of them are built into this animation software. They have very little penetration in this community. Um, so for the most part, these are still things that are done by hand. Actually, there's a research project in my own group uh, studying like machine learning techniques. So like maybe you watch an artist skin for a long time, and then you want to learn how they, they do it. Because this does seem like somehow a uh, manual process. But in any event, mathematically, the notation we'll use is WIJ is the, uh, for every vertex uh, I, the influence of bone J. So in particular, if I take WIJ and I, sum, I fix a constant I, so I look at one vertex, and I sum over all the J's, what should I get? One, right? Because it's like a weighted average. Okay. Um, right, and similarly, if WIJ equals 1, as a corollary, all the other WIJs for the same I should be 0, right? And this is saying that I'm just moving rigidly for bone J and vertex I. That basic language makes sense, this notation here? Cool. All right, and so um, the properties that we have are usually your weights are non-negative. What would happen if they were negative, by the way? I would, like, bend my joint this way and some part of my model would bend the other way. That wouldn't be so good. Um, and they typically sum to 1. Fun trivia fact, does anybody know what a set of functions that are non-negative and sum to 1 at every point? There's a mathematical term for this. Markov. Interesting. You're not wrong, but I don't... That's from a different area of math. That's, I wouldn't have thought of that. Any, any other terms? Convex combination, that would be the process of averaging stuff. What would the set of weights be called? Really, that was, that was what Darius was suggesting, right? Like Markovian. Um, that's right. So um, in geometry, uh, yeah? This is interesting. Somehow, I guess because of machine learning, you guys are much more focused in that area than when I usually teach this class. Um, so in geometry, we call this a partition of unity, which would be like a probability distribution per point on some domain, right? So there's sort of two ways to slice that, right? There, either at every point, you have a distribution over all the bones, or you look at one bone and then you get a function over the surface, uh, which is the weight of that bone at the different points. Right? Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> cool. All right, so uh, yeah, so a typical thing to do, by the way, is to limit the number of bones that can influence a single vertex. I think four bones per vertex is a pretty usual choice because I can't think of a spot on the human body where there's more than that that meet up. Um, Otherwise, I think this model of deformation is going to start to fail. Like, you really should do more complicated physics at that point. I guess for an octopus simulation, you might need a more complicated bone scenario. Right? So, so, so typically one thing to do is rather than store a, you know, bones by weights matrix of values where it's mostly zeros, you maybe just store the non-zero values. So think of it as a sparse matrix. Okay, so in this class we're going to assume that an artist has painted on the skinning weights and our task is just to animate the character just. Um, and, and that's what we're going to focus on, is how to compute the vertex positions. So we have any ideas? Let's say that, that you know, we, we know the transformation associated with every bone. We have uh, weights for, between every vertex on our base mesh and every bone in our deforming skeleton. What can we do? Yeah. That's exactly right. So like, a vertex on my elbow, I could move it two ways, right? I could move it with the upper arm or the lower arm. And now I'm going to use the skinning weight to take the weighted average of those two positions. And that'll be the world's simplest model for skinning. Is that physical? Does that have anything to do with how your skin actually deforms? No. Is there a first example of a physically plausible but model-driven thing where we're just coming up with a model that seems to work okay? But like we haven't like worked out you know the elastic dynamics of your skin and justified that this is a good approximation. Right? We're not doing that, we, and we won't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So those are our basic uh, principles here. We're going to transform every vertex with every bone, and then just blend the weights. Mathematically, the equation for that is quite simple, right? So remember that we have some transformation matrix that maybe goes 
you know, so maybe TJ is the matrix that takes you two bone J's coordinates or back, right? Then now I'm going to have a big set of different PIJs depending on for every vertex, every bone, you know, that'll end up in different places. And then I'm just going to take a weighted average. And that's what we're going to kind of dig into this formula a little bit and see how we might implement it in the context of the hierarchical mess that we developed in our last lecture. These things are compatible, but they're very annoying to code, as you will see on your next assignment. Okay, so let's, uh, let's fill in some vocabulary. So the first term, which I've already been throwing around a little bit in class, uh, is the bind pose. And this is the basic idea that um, I'm only want to model my 3D character one time, right? Like maybe I just want to model them standing like that, right? And so there's some pose associated to that, associated to my skeleton. It may not be that every skeleton parameter is zero in that pose. No reason for that. So the very first thing that I have to do is model my mesh in the bind pose and come up with a list of parameters for all of my skeleton joints that puts the skeleton in that bind pose. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Moreover, I need these, these skinning weights, so we're going to kind of focus in our little mini example. This is maybe somebody's arm, like the upper and lower arm, on a vertex P naught right at the elbow. So maybe his skinning weights are one half, one half. Okay? And now, when I bend it, what's going to happen? I'm going to take P naught, remember our kind of funny uh, index notation, so we have P naught 1 and P naught 2. This is P naught under the transformation for bone 1, P naught under the transformation for bone 2. So in other words, I took his elbow and I tore it in half, right? I now computed two points. And then, to get the actual position of the mesh, I just average them using the skinny weights. What does that mean about his elbow? That means that his elbow is actually just a straight line in some funny sense in this simple model, right? Like, so for example, one thing that this won't do is like if I bend this arm, maybe I notice the elbow actually does jut out a little bit, right? Um, and, and this kind of model can't handle that, right? It's, it's a convex combination of the points that you get in the individual uh, transformation. Can you guys spot anything else that goes wrong in this diagram here? We've been focusing on the bottom half. Yeah? Um, the two bones are now like intersecting. The bones intersect. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so what's going to happen to the, the armpit of the elbow? What, is, what do you call this area on your arm? <laughs> your inner arm? Whatever? is that it self intersects. The, 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 uh, the, the motions actually kind of flip position. It may actually be okay. That doesn't mean that the arm necessarily loops in on itself. But um, one thing you can see is a very typical phenomenon here where the arm has actually lost mass. It bends in far more than it should because somehow these uh, 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 different uh, uh, poses are, are, are intersecting in a funny way. Right? Um, yeah, so this is basically the uh, key example where, where things really go wrong. Incidentally, I think if you watch Toy Story 1, this kind of artifact shows up a lot. Um, you should go back and look. Okay, um, so we're going to keep that in our head. I'm going to think about other crazy places where that goes wrong. And then maybe re revisit that in a minute. Okay, so we're given our mesh in a bind pose. We have the undeformed positions. These are in. There's no coordinate system associated with your mesh, right? There's no hierarchical anything. Everything is just in one coordinate system which is the whole 3D model, yep. Um, but we do have the bind pose of the uh, skeleton, uh, and now um, we need to somehow match up our coordinate systems. But this is annoying, right? Because remember like when I want to deform my finger, that deformation is written in terms of the coordinate system of my hand. But my finger on the skin mesh is in the coordinate system of like my belly button, right? It's just like the whole body. And so what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to Compose all my transformations together to get the thing for the, the bone in the bind pose. Take this, this mesh, which is in world coordinates, translate it into bind coordinates, apply my transformation, and then undo the whole damn thing. And that's how I'm going to get my PIJs. Yeah? That's what you're going to implement on your homework. Okay, so, uh, right. So, uh, in other words, your, your, your T here is in some local coordinate system, and, and you've got to work that out. And so, Typically what we do in a phase called rigging, right? Rigging is where you're just going to place the bind pose and align that to the, uh, the pose of the skeleton. You're going to get some bone transformation, which is basically going to take you from the global coordinates of your 3D mesh into the local coordinates of each bone in the bind pose. 
right? Notice that this is just indexed by J, right? Because every bone is moving just in, a, in an affine way. Does that make sense so far? So every BJ is taking from coordinates of the triangle mesh of my 3D character into the coordinates of the, the, the bone. Actually, I guess, I'm sorry, I've already got it backward from the local bone coordinates to the global. By the way, when you implement this stuff, like, you're going to get it backwards. So you just have to keep looking at the definition that we, we give you, right? Yes, there he is. Uh, how did you get this matrix? Is it, like, from the stack? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so if I, remember we have this recursive piece of code that goes down the stack, and that's how I, I get to each of my bones. If I keep pre-multiplying that matrix, as I move down the stack, I just remember that for a given bone by composing them all together. Yes, cool. The artist has to provide it, right? So the artist has to sit there and, and, and tweak all the different parameters of the different bones to put it into a place. Yeah. Okay, so now we animate this guy and, and he bends his arm. You know, we put him into some running pose. And now what happens? Well, now there's, there's a new set of bone transformations, TJ, right? And those are the ones that we want to apply again to all the vertices by, by concatenating them all together again. So... This is our, our task here, right? And so in order to uh, do that, we need to take a vertex PI and transform it to TJ by TJs and local coordinates, and then take them back to the global coordinates again. So we're going to end up with one matrix inverse and one matrix not inverse. Yeah, in particular, our expression looks like this, right? So here, the PIJ prime, right? So PI, remember, is in the coordinates of the mesh. This thing takes you from local to global, so I need to invert it to take it from global to local. And then I apply my transformation, which is going to take me back through the hierarchy the other way. Right? This one is just the same one we talked about for the rendering process in the last lecture. Why do you go out and in? What was that? Why are we going out and then in again? Uh, you're actually going in and then out, right? Because remember, the, you have to read it right to left. Yeah, so this thing is in global coordinates, or it is in the coordinates of the mesh. This thing takes you into the coordinates of the bone. Okay. And then this guy is going to take you all the way back up out of the hierarchy to the thing that you render. But this one is incorporating all the like bends along the way. Yeah, it's easy to get this stuff backward. I do all the time. As you can see, it makes me nervous lecturing on this stuff because I always get it wrong. Um, and, and this is because really you should think about this stuff intentionally. And to make matters worse, different graphics libraries will implement like which matrix do you have around and which one is the inverse just to keep it on your toes, right? Because depending on what task you're doing, whether it's IK or forward kinematics, for example, it might be convenient to have one of these matrices where it's inverse. Yep. So then what are you going to do? Well, now that you have these, these PIJs, um, right? And remember, this matrix is nothing more than the relative change between the bone transformation and the current bind pose. Yep. Well, now we've got everything we need to do skinning, right? So now we just take a weighted average, you know, using these, these, these weights that were painted by hand. And we get our final expression here. Right? Notice that there's an of t here because this is the animated part. And uh, this is what's going to give our, our, our skin animated mesh. Right? So this is just a giant application of forward kinematics. Does that all make sense? By the way, if you're going to do inverse kinematics, that would be fine. It would just go into the computation of t. Right? That would kind of happen somewhere else. Yeah, and so, uh, right, so this is the matrix that transforms vertices. Now remember in your assignment zero, which I'm sure that you have all done by now, uh, that your mesh didn't just come with vertex positions, it also came with vertex normals. What am I going to have to do to the vertex normals? So let's say that I take this expression and I just parenthesize it, right? So I have, right, this is pi prime for the deformed mesh, and he's you know, the sum over j of uh, w i j uh, t j t p j inverse p i, and I just write brackets like that. What is this object that I've bracketed here? It starts with an M and ends with atrix. It's a matrix. Thank you. You guys are killing me. All right. So this matrix is taking me for the coordinates of pi to like sort of coordinates nearby, right? So if this thing is, what's a good letter for matrix? How about M? <laughs> and now my vertex is accompanied by normal, as vertices often are. What should I do to my normal? Yes. 
You multiply with the inverse transpose of m. Great, excellent. So that's exactly what you should do. And so that is going to conclude all of your, your skinning stuff. Right? By the way, after you do this, you probably want to divide it by its norm. Remember that this thing does not have to conserve uh, life. Okay, right, and that's our, our, our basic setup here. So here's our, 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 our pseudocode. So for every vertex, you just basically plug into this formula. And when I say basically, I mean get it wrong a thousand times, then finally it works, and you have a very rewarding afternoon. Um, because remember that these two matrices are really the result of traversing the, uh, the tree a bunch of times to, to compute them. And then uh, you compute that weighted average, you apply the inverse transpose to the vertex, or to the normal rather, and then you, you've got everything you need to do shading. Okay. So here's the basic issue. This is what we call a linear method. And now we can see why. Right? Because if we parenthesize the expression, this is the same as what I have on the board. This is just a matrix that's acting kind of locally. What happens if I take the average of two rotation matrices? Right? Like a rotation is somehow an innocuous motion. It's just like a, you know, preserves lengths and angles. Let's, let's figure this out. Every year I do this example and every year I make a sign mistake. Maybe this, this will be the year that I don't. So, um, remember our, our 2D Oops. and uh, here's a 2D rotation matrix. So, first, when theta is 0, what's our rotation matrix? Don't all speak at once. Identity, thank you. Um, yeah, let's write it up. So now, let's say that theta is equal to pi, 180 degrees. What's cosine of pi? What's sine of pi? Minus sine of pi. Cosine. Okay. These two things are rotation matrices, right? They don't, they, they, they're innocuous. They just move space around in a rigid way. What happens if my skinning, so let's say that I have an arm. I'm, you know, flexing my arm, so I bring it all the way back there. I assume that's what people do. Um, so what does that mean? That means that the matrix that's acting on the vertices in my arm region here is like roughly the average of these two things. What is the average of these two matrices? Zero. Is zero a rotation matrix? No. And that's what goes wrong with linear blend skinning that uh, transformations are just not linear, that's just life in the city. So, so locally they are, but when you, when you compose them together, if you have really extreme deformations, right, like that, that thing that we already saw where the arm started to intersect itself, that's where things start to go wrong. So that leads uh, to a particular artifact, which you, you may have seen before in old animated films. Right? This is the candy wrapper effect, which is that when I do linear blend skinning, things tend to shrink. And that's exactly what you see here, right? I, took two matrices that preserve lengths and angles, and when I averaged them together, it actually shrunk features, right? It scaled by zero, yeah? Uh, and so oftentimes in really low quality <coughs> animation, what you'll see is that, like, it's even worse if you, like, rotate your arm like that, uh, that it'll actually just shrink to zero. By the way, this really is what happens in candy wrappers, right? Because when you rotate, it's like, the wrapper's, like, trying to draw a straight line, and it can't. I'll let you think about that. Um, in any event, uh, there, there are many, 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 many techniques out there that try to revise this. Yes? Um, can we go back a little bit? Sure. Are we given the local bone So what you're given is the bind pose, right? Like the parameters of the skeleton that put the skeleton into that rest pose, right? Then you can, using the machinery that we talked about in our last class, you can compute all of those bone matrices BI. Excellent. Any other questions? Cool. Right, so there's a, there's a lot of different ways to fix this issue, and, and I encourage you guys, this is, by the way, this is an easy extra credit, because many of them are just different formulas to replace this linear, oops, uh, this linear blend skinning formula. The basic thing that goes wrong is that you're taking an average of matrices that are close to, typically are pretty close to uh, uh, rotation matrices, or like, you know, rigid motions, um, but when you average them, you don't get something back. So a very obvious thing here is to just come up with different ways to average um, motions that don't have this bad property. Uh, so one of the most popular uh, techniques um, 
is uh, to use something called quaternions. Uh, I noticed there's a question on Piazza. In fact, we actually give you most of the code that you need to do this in your assignment if you wanted to for extra credit. Um, quaternions is other way of writing down a uh, rotation matrix that doesn't have this, this particular issue. Um, kind of an analogy, by the way. So here, right, I have theta. Or I could uh, work with a different thing, which is like e to the i theta. Right? These are kind of in bijection. Notice that if I, I can think of this like a rotation, right? If I multiply it by another complex number, it'll rotate it. Yeah? But what goes wrong? Like if I, essentially, what did this calculation, what were we really doing? We were doing e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta, right? And that gave us something that we didn't like. A different thing that you could do would be to work in theta space, and then you wouldn't run into that problem. Right? Um, and so quaternions are sort of closer to doing that. Um, almost. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but... There's some nice analogies. OK, uh, right. So in order to actually compute the weights, there are many uh, methods out there, uh, or you just ask an artist to do it. Um, there's a very popular technique that's built into Photoshop for two-dimensional skinning, which is used like in 2D animation. Um, this is uh, bounded by harmonic weights by my colleague Alec Jacobson at uh, UT, uh, U of T, rather, in Toronto. Um, and these are still like topics of, of modern study. People still think about this kind of stuff. In fact, an even more challenging problem is automatic rigging, uh, where maybe your uh, animator makes some really bizarre 3D model, like this dude with these big ears here. And then your job is to either take a predefined skeleton, or even better, come up with a skeleton, come up with all of its degrees of freedom, and place it inside of the 3D model. And then if you're ambitious, compute the skinning weights on top of that. Right? Um, there are just a few few methods out there that attempt to do this, but they're really in their, their, their early stages. Right? Um, but if you guys like problems at the intersection of learning computer graphics, this is a great one, where essentially artists are losing a lot of time to a pretty unnatural task. Right? I mean, why are you asking them to paint skinning weights? It's not an artistic thing to do, it's just kind of mechanical. Um, but somehow, existing automatic tools don't do a particularly good job. Um, so if you want to look, there's a cool uh, paper out of MIT about a decade ago uh, that's sort of the most famous uh, technique for this, where in their case, they've taken a 3D character and a skinning, uh, and, and a skeleton rather, and then just output a rigged character. And I think they use skinning weights, in, they, they can be skinning weights in a very simple fashion, where you just compute your closest bone and you kind of take a weighted average. Um, but in any event, the uh, effects are already impressive, so let's see if we can play our video here. So here's our pig leg guy. Given a 3D character mesh and a generic skeletal motion, Pinocchio adapts the skeleton to the character and applies the motion to the shape. The result is an animated character. As we developed Pinocchio, we used about 70 different characters for testing. After Pinocchio had been completed, we tested it on 16 biped characters that we did not see or use during development. Here, all 16 of our test characters are shown. A single biped skeleton was used to animate all of them, demonstrating the generality of our approach. We make really creepy zombie animated Three characters. Three characters uh, required a single manual hit. hint to produce a good motion. Okay. So I believe this, this guy here is the one that you guys will animate on your assignment. Pinocchio typically takes under a minute to animate a character. Mm -hmm. Pinocchio is animated in the same way as a human animator would animate a character. Okay. There's an even, I mean, I was, I, was, I was talking about it before, but there's actually a funnier, oops, there's a, uh, a follow-up to that paper that um, wants to do retargeting, where they actually have this example of two of the old MIT grad students who uh, I happen to remember, uh, where like one guy just puts his hands on the other guy's back and they do tango and then they like translate it into the motion of a horse, which is a, it's like my favorite example for a graphics paper. Um, but then in addition to that, you have to do skinning, right? Skin 
a mesh sequence, we first estimate proxy bone transforms for the otherwise skeleton free mesh sequence. So the idea here the motion sequence of any triangle, we can compute its rotation sequence using the polar decomposition. Is that they, uh, we cluster these rotation sequence right. points using mean shift clustering, and thereby estimate near rigid mesh components. Mean shift clustering allows us to identify near rigid structure robustly in the presence of rotation sequence outliers and automatically determine the essential number of near rigid components with minimal parameter tweaking. The mean shifted triangle rotation sequences identify triangles undergoing similar near region motion, from which we estimate per frame bone transforms. So the basic point here is that they take a bunch of poses of one 3D model in the same topology, like the same mesh, over and over again. And then they want to do something that kind of looks like PCA, like what you might have seen in your machine learning course or statistics class, but on the motions of the individual triangles to kind of couple them together and then infer skinning weights from those. Um, I think that in the coming couple of years, you're going to see a lot of research papers in this area that are revisiting all these old problems now that we have uh, much better machine learning technology than we did, right? So now rather than having, right, the requirements of these things are a little bit unrealistic because they're asking you to have a bunch of poses of one 3D model, like an animated mesh sequence, which how did you get it? Well, you probably got it by articulating a mesh and actually doing all the stuff that this thing is trying to reverse engineer. Um, the more challenging version of this problem would be I have a big data set of 3D humans in a bunch of different poses, but they're all different humans. Now I give you a new human. Can I infer the rigging and the skinning weights and all that good stuff based on looking at other models of other people that are deforming in a similar fashion? And to my knowledge, this is a kind of fun open problem. So anyway, uh, that's the basic uh, uh, material that you guys need for skinning. As you can see, it's just an application of the last two lectures, right? So essentially, the new ingredient that we have is every vertex is accompanied with a set of weights telling you where it moves with all the bones. And then all the headache is to come up with a way to change coordinates from the coordinates of the mesh to the coordinates of the, mo the, the mesh in, a, in the bind pose. Then you deform the bind pose. Then you have to undo it all. Cool? So with that, if you haven't gotten your start on your assignments, please do. And uh, let's see. I guess I'll see you uh, on Thursday. We'll do some physics.